Hi, everyone. We're just waiting for Chelsea and Nishida. I'm here. Okay, perfect. Okay, let me just set the next speakers. Yeah, Ashita's here too. So I and guess the uh, host is Pavel, who's on the Meetis team. Yeah. So any here, <laughs> you guys might know Pavel. He's also working on the DVC. Yeah, yeah. Got got brought into uh, to host the spaces, um, but I'm more of the I'm more of the tech guy. But of course, I can um, uh, be more of a personality. So brought in to host this exciting spaces. Definitely want to uh, dig deeper into, uh, you know, future of work in Web3. Um, I guess we can get right into it. And, uh, and uh, yeah, cool, cool. So I guess welcome everyone to the spaces. Um, I'm pleased to have two special guests here. Um, Ishida and Chelsea. Uh, we're here to explore the future of work in Web3 and Web2 adoption uh, with the decentralized autonomous organizations as well as the decentralized autonomous companies, uh, DAOs and DACs respectively. So I guess I'll just jump right in and open the conversation uh, to have our wonderful guests introduce themselves. So I'll start with uh, Ishida. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Ishida. I'm a research analyst on the Masari team. Um, and in my work have been mo mostly focused on covering uh, infrastructure as of late, but I had my origins in crypto through DAOs. So I'm excited to dig in. Awesome. Awesome. Great to have you, Ishida. And uh, Chelsea, let's see. Well, let us know what you're working on. Thanks, Pavel, and uh, happy to speak with you today, Ishida. Uh, so I'm the co-founder uh, as well as chief operating officer of the DAC Econode, um, which is being incubated by Metis. And what that means is it's a decentralized autonomous company infrastructure. So we're building a product now. Uh, I'm pretty down the rabbit hole, too, with crypto, Web3, DAOs. Um, I was the former head of marketing at Meetees, and before that, I worked in the DeFi space. Awesome. Really cool to have you here today, and uh, excited to hear from you both. Uh, thank you for tuning in. So I guess uh, let's just start off with your background. Um, are you two in any DAOs yourself, and um, what have you research or contributed to down the DAO rabbit hole. I'll start with you, Ishida. So I, as I mentioned, had my start in crypto from DAOs. I got started in DAOs last summer. So I was working as a venture fellow at Bloomberg Beta, which is, it's a Web2 fund focused on the future of work. And the whole team and I were fascinated by DAOs and we we're trying to answer the question of okay, so there's this new type of organization. How are they actually different from organizations that we're used to? Um, that was actually kind of a tough question to answer. Um, and that's what kind of started my journey um, down the DAO rabbit hole. Um, since then, my, the first DAO I joined was Friends with Benefits, which is a social DAO. Um, and it's a DAO that I still stay active in. I met a lot of people through that community and it really helped me level up in Web3. Um, and then I also joined Kraus House, which is a uh, DAO that's trying to acquire an MBA team someday, which is very different and interesting. And uh, I'm also part of an investment DAO called WAMI. Um, it stands for We Already Made It. And it's just a small niche DAO and we're um, focused on interesting NFT projects, which is you know difficult to do kind of in this market, but we uh, bought a CryptoPunk, which was exciting. Um, so, you know, in general, in my research at Masari, I started covering investment DAOs and tooling um, and recently have been interested in treasury management um, as a topic within DAOs. So, yeah, that's where my starting crypto was. Awesome. So I hear like a lot of community building, a lot of this, this type of social aspect, you know, bringing people together and sort of doing things for, for a cause, like buying a CryptoPunk. Um, yeah, 
I, I guess, um, how about you, Chelsea? What, um, are you in any DAOs and um, what have you con researched or contributed to? Yeah, uh, so I am in a couple DAOs. Uh, I was first introduced to the DAO space through altcoin investing in 2019. I think a lot of people get into the industry uh, through investing. So I was one of them. Um, and I was financially invested in projects. So I became more and more interested in their communities. I didn't actually join or participate in any DAOs myself until late 2020. Um, but like Ishida was part of Social DAO. It's not as cool as FWB, um, but it's actually called Money Party. Um, but it, um, you know, it was in a community focused around investing. Um, it was an investment DAO, um, but it was social too. So we did some events, and um, and while I was, you know. In, investing and I was just jamming out behind my computer watching charts our day, all day um, and started to join DAOs. Um, I started to become an actual contributor. So it was also part of another DAO um, called Railgun. It's a privacy wallet, not a mixer. <laughs> so no worries, guys. Um, but it's a wallet. Um, and uh, so after I started contributing to that DAO, I um, it really changed my profession and opened a whole other Web3 world to learn about. Um, so in the beginning, I was really just behind my computer all day um, in a very strong absorption and learning phase. All things crypto, Web3, DeFi, I was pretty obsessed. Uh, sat uh, two hours a day for eight weeks in a Solidity boot camp um, with Encode. Um, and then I was contributing to the DAO as part of, and I was um, also... I just, as like a side passion project, I was hosting a, I decided to, to co-found and work on a DeFi conference. Um, and so I met a lot of people through the industry that way, um, which was really great, but it was just like a passion project on the side. Um, but by contributing to projects and it's like this centralized way, like contributing to a DeFi project, contributing to a major networking event, um, being a part of investment DAO, um, I had the opportunity to build a network, grow my professional skills and experience. Um, before that, I was in Web2 um, financial software sales um, and in um, marketing. And then, uh, but I went full time and ended up working at Meetis. And I was running the marketing team for a while and recently shifted over to building the decentralized autonomous company infrastructure and co founding that project. Awesome. Lar large amount of experience and of course started from humble beginnings with uh, with like investments and then like grew into a lot uh, with that. So that, that that's awesome. I think um, I think a lot of us here started off like, oh, you know, like just taking in one aspect and then going deep down the rabbit hole upon discovering like a niche. I, th I think that's like where a lot of uh, a lot of people started, and it's good to hear that that uh, both you, Ishida, and and uh, and Chelsea have gone through the very similar paths as well. So I guess uh, I want to continue the conversation related to DAOs. Uh, in this case, what is the current state of DAOs, and what are you most excited about for the DAO space? Ishida, I'll start with you. Yeah. So I think most people in the space would agree with this, but DAOs are highly inefficient today. Um, you know, mostly because compared to other organizations, they're still in their infancy. Like we've only known them a few years compared to other types of corporations or um, more established types of entities. Um, I mean, and they're also trying to restructure so many aspects of an organization, like, you know, removing the leader, um, doing everything on the internet and being internet native. Um, and then this naturally means it'll take them much longer to come to a state of being fully functional and adopted in, in a mainstream way. Um, and in the last cycle, we hit a point where DAOs were managing more than 10 billion in assets. Um, but a lot of it was still centered around the top few DAOs. Um, and 
there was also like this onslaught of Dow tooling being built and you know the, a lot of those will probably won't be used in the long term and there aren't being used currently there's I would say like 10 to 20 tools that are actually being used by multiple DAOs. Um, so I think that in this upcoming cycle, we'll see kind of value being more equal across DAOs. There's going to be more membership. There, there will be um, more tools that are adopted that we didn't see in this last cycle. Um, and then DAO membership was at a peak because of the bull market and uh, because of, you know, because of this, token-based compensation was enticing. Um, and so right now we're in a down market and things are changing. So um, like this is kind of corny to say, but this is the time to build. Um, and what I'm excited about is to see a lot of positive changes for DAOs. And one of them is really establishing what proper use, use cases are. Um, as I mentioned, I think investment DAOs are really interesting because DAOs help form and deploy capital really quickly and investment DAOs make sense for that and um, the other exciting use case which is kind of it is a little bit boring is protocol DAOs um, they're massive and they usually form around a highly valued product but um, because of what's at stake these are these tend to run really well um, but so I think that what I'm really excited about is to see more use cases come out. And I think naturally with more established use cases, we'll see more efficient DAOs. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I like the point that you mentioned how like there's DAO tooling, but only like 10 tools are, are being used and uh, useful. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe snapshot, tally, um, yeah, civil. Gnosis. Yeah. Gnosis. Yeah. 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 So, so I guess they've sort of concentrated around like, certain use cases and tools and then investment dials. I like that you pointed out that as well as being like a big, big factor. Like syndicate is, is, is like big on, on, on that. And uh, yeah, de definitely protocols, like they need a way to manage assets in a way that's, uh, you know, encourages the community development. So I like all the points that you mentioned. Um, what about you, Chelsea? Uh, what is the current state of DAOs and, what are you most excited about in the DAO space? Well, I um, like Ishida mentioned, uh, really excited about all the growth in the DAO space. And this has been really remarkable. Um, so we've watched just the Web3 industry uh, explode. Um, so there's $3.2 billion um, dollars worth of Web3 industry revenue in just 2021. Um, and it's expected to reach uh, and grow um, by in to, uh, to 2028 up to like 23 billion. That's just like an estimate. But uh, with that, also the DAO space is expected to grow too. Um, and right now, just DAOs specifically in total have uh, $10 billion worth of assets. Um, so uh, there's definitely an industry and opportunity um that i see uh, uh that this space can uh, tap into um and so i think that the like for ethos and the structure of DAOs um have witnessed a lot of hype uh like through this cycle but it's more than just based on the like like a lot of the DAOs um right now and this like token structure masters but it's also based on the like the contributor body and the ability to grow a community um, and this has been very valuable um, so this is fueled by this like vision and decentralization and of democratization and governance um, but tapping into um, you know those operations within a DAO the decentralization um, opportunities as well as the ability to govern the DAO. Um, there has been some inefficiencies that we've seen uh, and, and it's very early, um, but really, you know, this glue that um, brings like, that makes us different than, you know, other industries is that there's um, this opportunity to grow a community, have contributors from anywhere participate in the DAO. Um, and you can have invested members um, be a part of the DAO as well. So they care about the success of that project. 
Um, so that's really unique. And I'm very excited about that, of course. And I do think like the hype around, you know, just this like ethos and everything is dying down a bit, but, and now it's geared towards more, um, like what's the sustainability of the DAO? Um, and you know, how are these, um, DAOs actually operating? What's the efficiencies and how to address the issues that they're facing? Um, and so one of them being like, there's, like with all this growth, uh, really there's only like 18% of DAO token holders that are actively engaged in a DAO's operations. Uh, I do think that there can be a better optimization of that. Um, I think it comes from, you know, DAOs being too heavily concentrated by token holders who are more concerned, concerned with like token go up um, than the actual success of the project behind it. So I'm excited for just a more mature shift um, you know, towards like contributor and community optimization. Uh, and that's what I'm working on with Metis, um, to the shift to the decentralized autonomous company, the DAC, uh, which is a more company and business focused approach to managing, um, internet native companies, decentralized companies and communities. Uh, and it centers around like business goals, operations, contributors, um, and really optimizing for the success of the company. Um, so just evolving those shortcomings that we've seen in these earlier phases uh, to create an infrastructure that's more useful for businesses and companies. And that's why we call it a DAC, because um, it's for the business, it's for the company. Awesome. I like, uh, I like those statistics and metrics that you pointed out, especially like in the Web3 revenue is expected to just shoot up um, to, I believe it was uh, 23 billion from, from like 3.2 to 23. That's like massive. And uh, as well as like the differences between DAOs and, um, and DACs in terms of like token, token voting and, 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 and whatnot. Um, I guess in, in, in this case, like, and, and, and sorry, you mentioned like 18% of token holders actively engaged in DAO's operations. Mm -hmm. So I guess, I guess, uh, and so, so in this case, like 18% of the decision-making is done by like, I guess the, the, the asset management and, and, and whatnot is done by like a small percentage. And then, um, yeah, yeah. Anyways, it's, 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 it's interesting, interesting. So, um, I guess in, in, in this case, to continue on, um, why would a group want to be a DAO or a DAC? So uh, I guess, yeah, Ishida. Yeah, so, so thinking about a DAO, um, I think there's a few reasons that really set apart a DAO from a typical organization and the reason why they're advantageous. So the number one reason that I mentioned before is the speed of capital. So you can form capital, deploy it really quickly. So we saw that with Constitution DAO. Um, and doing this makes other processes within an organization so much more efficient because you're paying people faster and you're getting to resources faster. Um, and you know we always see this with you know people trying to do business um, in the Web2 world and you're wiring money and it takes a really long time. So just imagine how many things could be streamlined if you're just sending capital and it reaches the next person within seconds or minutes. Um, and then DAOs offer a better governance framework. Um, I mean, as Chelsea mentioned, people are, don't really participate, but if, if we figure out how to really align incentives and people participate, DAO governance is actually... Um, ideal because it's more democratic, it's more equal, and you're getting inputs from all parts of your organization instead of just at the top. And, you know, corporate governance is, the decision making is very inefficient and it's gated to only a few members of the organization and um, it doesn't lead to optimal results because you're missing data points from other parts of your organization. Um, and, you know, the third is really aligned incentives. You know, token governance hasn't figured itself out um, and token holders with more with significant holdings compared to the rest of the DAO are often more active in the community and end up making the decisions because they have more weight um, but I think there is a lot more work to be done there but 
when we figure these things out, it will really set apart a part of DAO from a from organizations that we're used to. And we might even see like companies and corporations take different elements of how a DAO works and use it up for their for themselves without you know, completely decentralizing, completely um, becoming this internet native organization. Um, yeah, I I would say those three come to me top of mind. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And and definitely there are uh, democratic processes um, that are very useful. You know, most most people maybe at the top don't know the specifics um, that perhaps everyone can know to make that decision. So I think I think that's uh, an interesting um, interesting view. So what about you, Chelsea? Why would a group want to be a DAO or a DAC? Um, well, definitely because there are, the members are invested in a lot of these DAOs. Um, so a DAO uh, could have a token or an NFT that members are either holding or staking. So a DAO would want to um, or a company would want to form a DAO or a group of founders would want to form a DAO um, because they have that token or NFT um, and they, um, I guess, not promote it. And definitely that's a goal, but, um, you know, allowing for, um, you know, those um, per those buyers of the token or the NFT to become members of that group. Um, so you know, that's in like the, the framework of the DAO, um, you know, to have these invested members. So I think that you know, that's one major reason to have a DAO. Um, and then ideally, those invested members, they are interested in the success of that DAO or that project um, or that DAC. Uh, not necessarily seeing um, an optimization of that potential, I would say. Um, Right now, you know, as Sheeta mentioned, there's the the strong concentration of token holders who they're invested, and therefore they have the majority of voting power and say in how a DAO is governed. But they might not even be participating um, or too concerned about that. Um, so shifting that away from just being focused on like a token models, I think is like, very important, but, um, yeah. So also another reason why a group would want to create a DAO or a DAC is that there's a lot of, um, growth potential, uh, in terms of, for instance, marketing. Uh, so you have this like grassroots community, uh, that is invested, um, interested, contributing, and they are also able to expand the message of that DAO or project um, because they're actively involved and have the potential to do so. Um, so around like a message and a group, um, and so I think that that's that's very um, that's very appealing to someone who wants to start a DAO. Um, or decentralized community is that just that growth potential that you have, or um, you know also like same th things you see some DAOs with a lot of developers, so you can create a very strong like developer community who's actually contributing code um, to the project, and so you can have this like borderless hiring um, for contributors, uh, which I think is very powerful for um, DAOs and DACs that you don't see with traditional companies. Um, you know, traditional companies, like they put a job listing up and then they have to interview and then hire that person full-time salary, everything. Um, but in the DAO model, DAC model, um, yeah, you can have salaried or monthly people get paid on a monthly basis. Um, yes, for sure. There are definitely space for that, but there's also space for um, contributors um, and members who are um, a part of um, contributing, you know, just like um, um, on a task by task basis. Um, or, um, um, you know, contributing to multiple DAOs and DACs. So um, I think that that's, I, I think this is like a very strong opportunity um, and it just makes it very different than like the traditional company. So I think any DAO or DAC um, or business that wants to tap into that like expansiveness and that growth potential, that's why they'd want to um, form a decentralized entity. 
Awesome. I hear very key similarities in terms of uh, both Ashida and Chelsea is, is that the um, decentralized work environment is for building and essentially like a easy way to bring capital on board and use it effectively is the main theme and the main goal of these types of decentralized communities, organizations, companies, essentially making things much more efficient and faster than uh, traditional organizations. To continue on the point of just the DAO space, um, you know, where the um, essentially like like why would it be? Why would one be a DAO or a DAC? Um, I guess uh, in in this case, we see like the potential for these different types of entities to evolve. Right? It's still early, um, so we can see things grow. And we have seen things grow since 2016, where the DAO formed and uh, collapsed. But then we've seen different types of models and mechanisms like Moloch DAO coming from it, coming from the ashes. Uh, I mean, I think literally figuratively as well, because they're like <laughs> based on like the you know, Moloch. Uh, anyways, anyways. So you have different types of these di the entities forming from the failures or from the uh, or, or choosing a different direction to take things. So definitely different types of DAOs have sprung, sprung up with that mindset. So with that, um, since there's still different types of models and mechanisms out there, um, how do you see them best evolving? To which direction do you see? Uh, we'll start with Ishida. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I mean, even though we have a few years under the belt, like I totally agree, we're, we're still early and um, a lot of things are still massively broken. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of work that's being done. I think there's, you know, a lot of potential for DAOs um, and we will eventually get to a place where anyone can start a DAO and be a part of one really easily. And it's, it doesn't have to be the crypto native person. Um, I think that one of the major things we'll see, and it's already a part of the conversation is the whole leaderless versus leaderful organization debate. Um, people have kind of all reached the consensus that leaderless organizations and flat organizations aren't ideal because they unravel when there's no, uh, no point of instruction and within a community and people are just all talking over each other and nothing's actually being executed. Um, so I think we'll land somewhere in the middle, maybe not middle, one of the sides where there is some leadership, but it's not a, a centralized organization. Um, I think we'll see more specialization of DAOs. So kind of like DAC, DACs, um, they're business focused. So the they have their own infrastructure and support for any DAO that's trying to, you know, build a DAC. So that's very specific. And maybe we'll see more around the social side. Like we've, we've seen tons of social DAOs and they've figured out what tools they need, what types of people join and what they need to do to build a community. And um, there will be infrastructures for just to support that kind of DAO. Um, and I think the big thing that's holding all of this back is legislation. Um, there's nothing really in place to let a DAO establish itself. Um, I mean, we've seen the Wyoming DAO uh, legislation. It doesn't really, at the end of the day, like one person within a DAO is still held liable. Um, so until we've kind of figured out that, that side of things, I think DAOs will be held back. But um, I, this is, might be a big prediction, but I think in 10 years we'll have like millions of DAOs on the internet um, with different goals and functions. Um, and each DAO will make its own decisions about governance, leadership, and membership. And this will vary. And I also think that we struggle to understand and refine DAOs today because we were trying to kind of squeeze them into one this one polished definition of what a DAO is. But they're not ownerless organizations. There's different things happening within these communities and it's not working out. So I think we'll see different types of DAOs and they, 
they might end up specializing and we'll see more DACs, we'll see social communities and investment DAOs. Um, but yeah, I think in 10 years, there's going to be millions of DAOs. But until until we get, we, we, don't, we won't really get to that point until like legislation's figured out and we've kind of settled a lot of these debates that are going on. I like that point that you mentioned about regulation. Um, yeah, that, that's a very big thing, especially entering in this space. We've seen, you know, like, like no type of action being done towards any DAO until the CFTC came in with Uki DAO and, you know, they, they, they targeted it. So now that sort of like that shook up the entire space within, um, you know, like, okay, I can't just create a decentralized community and then have it, you know, be regulation less. Um, and and um, it was it was uh, I, I guess at a conference I I, I spoke to a person and uh, describing basically the, the the regulatory aspects with with the DAOs and, and it's kind of like if you don't choose your regulatory framework um, it's, it's kind of like uh, you know choosing your prison husband before the, the prison husband chooses you so if if, if you don't choose the law then all laws apply. And, so uh, you know, that, and um, that definitely want to, um, yeah, yeah, so say that like the current structures in place, um, I mean, sure, there's Wyoming, there's Delaware DAOs, but they're, I would say, not, um, not the best. Of course, it's still room to grow, still room for having more clear regulations and um, regulatory frameworks and hopefully there would be more specified cases like investment DAOs, for example are legal there's legal structures in place you know you can't have over 100 members and they're like you know they're, they're kind of like investment groups so that those are more clearly defined so i like how you said that there's different types of categories in place so maybe there's room for DAOs or dacs to have their own specific category to fit within their own specified regulatory framework. And so you just pick your flavor of regulation. So um, very, very good points there. Um, I wanna uh, transition to Chelsea. How do you see DAOs evolving into uh, decentralized autonomous companies? Yeah. Um... And I like the big topic of um, also needing clear regulations. Um, I think that it's kind of like a band-aid we need to rip off. Um, it's not like we don't want any regulations. We just want some clear understanding of the frameworks. Um, but to answer your question, yeah. So for DAOs um, to evolve to DAOs, so one thing that we were all we were touching on is how inefficient um, DAOs um have been in these early stages uh so they're very easy to start and hard to maintain so for the current DAO tools that exist today they focus on one area for example um there's a DAO tool that helps you create a DAO but then um once you have that DAO you'll use a different tool for governance like snapshot or another tool for payroll like superfluid um and there's another tool for issuing bounties and managing your tasks. Uh, so this is all decentralized and everything, but how efficient is that really um, for actually managing a company? Um, so the decentralized autonomous company infrastructure we're building instead allows companies to manage um, what we consider the major pillars and components of the Web3 business on one platform. Um, so you can manage a company while using decentralized components like managing your multi-sig, um, uh, having governance, and as well as decentralized hiring for tasks and jobs. Uh, so you can have these like core components of running a company um, and you can do it through decentralized tools. Uh, so we consider this efficiency structure, infrastructure and move um, the DAC infrastructure. Um, so versus the DAO, which is, I guess, more experimental and is almost like just like a concept. Um, and there can be all different types of DAOs. You can have social DAO, you can have a 
uh, investment DAO. You can have um, like DAO for like uh, you have NFT based DAO. Um, so there's all these different types of DAOs, but um, for the company, um, for the DA, the DAO that wants to operate as a company, um, that would be the DAC. Um, so I would say that for the DAC model, um, uh, way in which it's changing, um, you know, just like different pieces of those components, like governance. Um, so, you know, the uh, centerpiece of a DAO, as we know it, is governance. Uh, not everyone participates, um, but it's in the form of token governance, which has its criticisms. Um, and we, at the, um, what we're doing, um, what we're building for the DAC is we think that um, governance should be based more on um, those who earn it um, for one. So if you are an individual or um, a contributor contributing to a DAC, then you have um, currently worked or you are you worked on certain tasks or projects for that company um, on the DAC platform, um, then you would be um, you would earn a credential for um, completing a task, working on a certain job, which would be reflected in your profile, which we consider a like on-chain resume. Um, so you have your, um, you know, just your individual profile represents you. Um, and then as you're navigating through, um, you know, the DACs that you're in or exploring other DACs, um, and working on tasks um, or completing certain quests or missions. Um, missions, no, I don't think anyone calls it missions, but <laughs> quests, I guess, is similar terminology. Um, but you would be able to earn the credential that um, you've earned your credential, have it, um, you own that, and then you'd be able to use the contributor um, uh points that you've earned as well as the contributor badges and you'd be able to like stake that um and essentially you can use your um level of contributions what you hold in terms of what you've earned through contributions as a way to vote or launch proposals um so the governance model isn't focused on what you own how many tokens you have it's also focused on your um like how much skin, like how much time, energy, um, and that you put into it. So it's more um, for the uh, governance evolving to like a social governance um, uh, model. Um, so that's one area. And, and I'd say just, you know, like a focus on that contributed model is why a DAO um, that's a company wants to be a DAC. So they want to, um, you know, focus on, you know, having like company operations, um, uh, fulfilling and sourcing work, um, and um, not just having a DAO that has a bunch of members who hold a token. Um, so that's a reason why a DAO would want to be a DAC. Um, and then there's like other potential areas of governance that like, we're exploring. Um, so like DAOs, Web3 um, companies, you know, some of them are, you know, have like traditional company type, like HR structures and stuff, but a lot of them don't. Um, so what does that look like in Web3? How can that be decentralized in some way? Um, so that could be through um, using governance as a form of dispute resolution um, and uh, that integrating reputation um, as well, uh, so on-chain reputation. And uh, so say for instance, an individual contributor was unpaid by a DAC or um, a community has criticisms over the direction of a DAC or how it's running operations, um, then contributors can use governance um, to vote for or against a dispute. Um, and if those disputes reach certain thresholds of support, then a DAC also reflects this in their own reputation. So it's kind of like a glass door rating system. So it's like reputation and just is it just for the contributors or the members, but it's also for the DACs. Um, so the DAC, um, so members be able to see, okay, do I want to work for that DAC? Um, is it reputable? Um, and that DAC is earning that through um, how... Um, like the community um, 
votes. Um, but it would be if you have like a certain threshold of support. So not just like every dispute is going to, you know, like impact that um, DAC rating. Um, but if it is like a certain threshold of support, then it could reflect on the DAC reputation. Um, so that's another area too. Um, uh, so, so I'd say uh, just kind of like professionalizing up the DAO um, and building an infrastructure for that is why they'd want, um, why a DAO would want to be a DAC. Interesting. So essentially what you're describing is changing from the current model for DAO-based governance as a proof of stake, where essentially you buy tokens, which you have a stake in the, in the DAO, and then you get to vote, to more so of a proof of work model, where you contribute into the DAC, and then you're able to make these types of decisions or actions or be influenced by uh, other, you know, by your own actions, essentially. So an in, in, interesting model, definitely, uh, definitely could see that growing into one of a sort of creator based economy where people can show what they, instead of what they put into the system through monetary purposes, it could be through more so of, of what they put into the system through the, through what they contributed. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So, in this case, um, so that that's like evolution from DAOs to DACs. So, what about um, what do you think about the tools that are currently present, and what tools do you think might be needed most uh, to function for 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 both DAOs and DACs to function properly, uh, or at least like better uh, maybe maybe than they are or um, what what tools would you would you recommend in in, in, in that case if, if you think that there's like a specific workflow that you think so I guess just to reiterate the question um, what tools do you think web three companies like DAOs and DACs need most uh, we'll start with Ashita yeah so I mean we have tools for everything under the sun right now being built and funded um, but for the most part, DAO tooling is still not composable, um, and each tool requires a different onboarding process, and they all don't live in one place. Um, and you know, this can like in theory can be solved by all in one DAO tooling, but that's also not the answer because they often tend to lack the ability for communities to customize based on needs, or at least the ones that you know, have been out and about. Um, so I think that there is DAO tools, they exist, but they need to be more composable and they all kind of need to be easy to use for both the DAO veteran and also the new person that just joined Web3. Um, I mean, in, like specifically, like as I mentioned, DAOs are still really horrible at managing treasure their assets. Um, and then managing their treasuries. So, uh, you know, even though I mentioned that DAOs at one point owned more than 10 billion in assets, um, a lot of that was composed of their native token and they lost a lot of value um, the months after that. Um, so in terms of specifics, I think there needs to be better tools and practices around treasury management. Um, and then I think that the we need better ways to support DAO workers. Um, and if we don't do this, we lose out on DAO progress. So um, I'm a big fan of WorkDAO, which is be building legal wrappers to facilitate hiring from different jurisdictions for DAOs um, and, and to make sure that DAOs are adhering to labor laws. So uh, Chelsea mentioned this as a solution that DACs come up with, but if a DAO doesn't pay you, there's little, little you can do today like, how would you sue a DAO? There's, it's very vague. Um, and so it's really cool to hear that DACs implement this, like, glass door type of system where um, the entity is, uh, their reputation's at risk and that it's held accountable to make sure that it's doing the things that it promised to do. Um, yeah, so 
I think overall better treasury management practices and more contributor support, which both of these in the end ensure that the DAO will be sustainable in the long term. Um, because if you're not managing your treasury correctly, um, you lose a lot of value and people are less incentivized to work for you when they leave. Um, but I think the trend that I want to see is there's more composable tools, like everything lives on a different plane and it's hard to plug and play everything. Um, so excited to see that become a trend. I think we'll see that once people kind of decide what DAO tools they want to use and then we'll see more integrations within them. I like how you mentioned treasury management and, and composability across different ecosystems. I think that, you know, having the ability to pick and choose the tool that works for you is one of the ethos. And that's, uh, of course, well, one single workflow can't fit everyone, uh, but better treasury management um, and having that being the, the, the way that you can uh, make sure that a DAO or a DAC can sustain itself long term. I think that that is uh, very essential within uh, within the industry. So definitely Gnosis Safe, one of the most popular asset management, but it's still um, you know liable based on the key signers that are allowed to execute since since it is a multi sig wallet. But of course, other other asset management tools likely exist and um, are might be better. I mean, MakerDAO as well has their own type of like asset treasury management managed by the entire organization and um of course like they it's like a balance between decentralization centralization like a lot of their assets are actually based in usdc but i think that you know the ability to make this decision where they prefer stability and um long-term uh, asset management over um over that decentralization i think that everyone can, having that ability to change and having that ability to just make these decisions, managing the assets can ensure that something like an organization can stay relevant uh, throughout all the years. So, excellent. Um, and with that, um, Chelsea, you man both Ashita and Chelsea, you mentioned both about uh, reputation, how that can influence things like a Glassdoor style system or even something like a Yelp review or Amazon or, 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 or whatnot. So uh, Chelsea, um, can you tell us more about reputation power in DACs? Yeah, um, so I talked about it a bit. Um, and for one, if you are a member of a DAC, um, you can build your on-chain resume through contributing to tasks or working on um, or for a certain DAC. Uh, and with that, um, you know, that's powered by, that's your reputation power, um, but your professional reputation power, your Web3 resume um, per se. So um, I think that it's a really, um, you know, great opportunity uh, for this space. Uh, so you see that, you know, we have our, our we're, we're um, a lot of DAOs and communities, they're on Telegram, they're on Discord, um, and you know, people get to know each other in like the chats and, but uh, how do you show uh, besides just like a paper resume, what you've done on chain uh, and how do you prove that? Um, so be able to earn that um, and have a resume that, um, has these like immutable credentials that you've earned, I think is a really strong opportunity to really, um, represent the person behind, um, these internet native companies, these contributors. Uh, so that's one way reputation, um, is being used, uh, and, and being built, uh, especially in like the professional space. And then also having a like, glass door style um, system where, you know, the DAC too, it's not all about the contributor. They're, they're not only uh, evaluating the contributor. Um, uh, the contributors also are evaluating the DACs. Um, 
So having DACs have reputation, whether that's based on how many members there are, um, how many tasks that were, um, um, how much work has gotten done. So, you know, proof of work, like how like active is that um, DAC in terms of um, issuing work, paying contributors, and also, um, you know, the um, uh, ability for contributors to impact that um, reputation by um, if there is any type of disputes or issues um, that could also be reflected for the DAC um, to better help it, any a job seeker, or those um, looking to work at um, those companies, uh, evaluate if they want to um, uh, work for them, or just kind of um, and, uh, just uh, um, uh, get a preview before they like jump right in and start working with their teams. Um, so I think that that's that's um, you know these these are definitely huge opportunities for the Web three space right now. Um, and I kind of link it to a like a professional social media. Um, I don't like to use the word social because I think we think Facebook and Instagram and the fun ones, um, but kind of like um, developing out that LinkedIn network, but for Web3 based decentralized companies. Um, so it's a huge opportunity there. Um, and then, yep, so, you know, just having a, like the DAO or the DAC being able to source um, work. So as there are um, contributors who are earning their credentials, uh, DAC can go and they can find um, contributors who have like a public resume, on-chain resume, um, in order to do certain works so of looking for devs. Uh, they could go and find devs that have worked on quality projects um, in the past um, or what, and, you know, specify what they're looking for. Uh, so that's how I see reputation power being used uh, for DAC specifically. Um, there can be used for other reasons too, um, like in other areas and verticals, also like social reputation, which I think is crazy. Um, but I think it's more clean cut and uh, less scary territory to you know build a, a professional reputation. Um, so I'm glad I'm not in like the social reputation realm. But yeah, the reputation is always being used in various different ways of being developed right now throughout the space. It's really cool. Um, but I'm focusing more on the professional side for DACs. Yeah, that, that's a, that's an interesting aspect. And um, I guess in, in terms of just the, the overall uh, system, uh, definitely on resumes, you know, people extend the truth and people like say like hey i worked for this or that's on linkedin you can say that you're a nasa astronaut um without anyone batting an eye you don't need to like prove that so i think having a way to prove that you have indeed like worked for a specific dao or that you've helped you know refine a system and then having that like ability to share kudos in a peer-to-peer -peer type of way uh, i think that can be you know, very beneficial for the future. Definitely want to see more of that system, how that can be leveraged out uh, better. Uh, and, and then definitely excited to see more, more of that like expansion because I've, um, I know that, you know, like even personal experiences, you know, you have to go through a resume and then you're like, Hmm, do they really like have this amount of work experience? And do they really have like this amount of um, educational experience? Like, Okay. And then you, you sort of have to call up every university and sort of say, oh, dude, are they on the registry? Are they on the on the thing? So having a way to just, you know, at, at a glance, just see like, hey, yeah, attesting everything is, is, is good to test yeah, it by this exactly. address. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, no it's very exciting, too, because I have seen projects now um, are putting degrees on chain. Um, so that'd be really cool too, just to add that to your on-chain resume. Um, we don't have that accreditation yet, but mm -hmm. yeah. And then um, yeah, just I guess I guess moving on, uh, you know, re really quick since we're we've almost hit the limit. Um, in terms of the uh, reputation power, so continuing off of that, uh, Ishida, how do you see? Web2 teams adopting tools like reputation power and credentialing or like using it within things like a decentralized job board 
or, or any, any, any other uh, qualities that you can think of? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, just this is going to be similar to some of the points that Chelsea made. Um, so Web2 teams can adopt decentralized tools in order to streamline their own processes. Um, so the on-chain credentialing and resume uh, feature is actually really important because, um, as you mentioned, reputation and resumes are based on a single party right now. And it's the person that wrote the resume. And um, it's actually worked pretty well so far. Like people might be lying, but it's kind of worked out because you do background checks. Um, but it isn't perfect and it's a very broken process. So on-chain credentialing you know, allows for that objective uh, recording of information about a person and their reputation, um, which will help any team. It doesn't matter if they're a Web3 company or not. Um, it'll help them make better decisions about hiring. And also, it'll help us make better decisions about who we let into our sacred communities and spaces that we're building on the internet, um, which, you know, because you're not seeing these people in person, like it's a little bit more scary. Um, so on the DAO side, Govern is building this. Govern is one of my favorite teams right now. And um, like it, I could totally see this product being used by a Web2 team. Um, and then, you know, decentralized job boards are also really valuable and can be put to use. Um, there's something called WorkQuest that's uh, like a job board monitored by a DAO. It connects employers and candidates globally. And everyone on the platform is incentivized through on-chain rating and feedback. So kind of like the DAC infrastructure that Chelsea was mentioning. Um, it almost sounds like Glassdoor, and it, but it's completely managed by the community. So folks are bought into the mission of the platform. Um, and so the beauty of using something like this is the transparency and the lack of a central authority calling the shots, which means there's more equality for employers and candidates alike. Um, I think incumbent Web2 tools are going to be hard for teams to offboard from. But I think once the Web3 and decentralized tooling becomes more established, I absolutely see Web2 teams adopting them. Definitely agree with that last point. Um, more uh, once we demonstrate that use case, I think that it'll be easier for other industries to adopt it as well. Um, so for beyond Web3, um, how do we see DAOs or decentralization being onboarded by Web2 or enterprises? So I guess like the, to the point of, of, um, of offboarding, um, how, how do you see like what, what is missing in terms of people being onboarded to the ecosystem? Um, so we'll, we'll start with you, Ashita. Yeah. Um, I think we're we're a bit away from web two companies or enterprises adopting DAO tooling. Um, but one of the first things that I see companies really open themselves up to is the DAO governance process. So today and historically, corporate governance has been a very stale and antiquated process that all boards use. Um, there's issues around transparency, which basically doesn't exist. There's lack of accountability and conflicts of interest at all levels because it's just a really select group of people making decisions for entire organizations um, with thousands of people. Um, and we know that DAOs present a novel framework for govern governance that's almost democratic, democratic and it demolishes some of the issues that traditional governance runs into because of the nature of a DAO. Um, I think at the end of the day, DAOs works for very specific types of organizations and communities. And for the most part, we'll see um, companies stay intact and they, and a lot of organizations stay as they are. But I think that we can borrow a lot from DAO governance. And I think that once corporations realize, okay, we can evolve this process and we can, um, I don't know, bring in a token. We can do all these things that we haven't been doing. Um, we'll see adoption um, because corporate decision-making is not efficient and, you know, better governance will lead to better decisions. Um, and because DAOs are niche and 
broken, a lot of corporations are looking at them and turning away right away. Um, you know, once we become more established, I think governance from DAOs will be borrowed first to corporations, and then we'll see more changes happen that way. Yeah, I I agree, and also like the the big aspect of of the Web three like DeFi space, like a couple billions worth. Um, I think that would also be a motivator in there. But yeah, it, it does take time, especially for um, corporate way to adopt a completely new and separate process. Uh, but what about you, Chelsea? Like, how do you see DAOs or decentralization being onboarded by Web two companies or enterprises? Yeah, I think I definitely don't think there will be a s sweeping restructuring of current corporations um, and companies um, and, you know, a huge major shift to Web3. But, um, you know, Web2 and enterprises, they are cur curious and dabbling um, into things like Web3 infrastructure um and just different opportunities within our space uh so you know during the last cycle we saw for instance um and it's actually quite um a, a um like a successful trajectory but we saw um nike adidas tiffany um they hopped on the nft bandwagon they launched collections um, so this is a dabbling, not all Nike went Web3, um, they're not running a major DAC or company, um, but they're, you know, we're uh, building a specific, um, like, business arm um, or business line um, and launching a specific project, which is the uh, like collection that's Web3. Um, so I can see... Um, for instance, that collection in itself, why didn't they build um, or why don't they have a DAO or a DAC around that collection? Because there are benefits to having um, a DAO like infrastructure or DAC. Uh, so they have, you know, this collection now and NFTs are actually, you know, considered tokens. Um, so they have this token, this NFTs. Um, so you have people invested um, and how can that community uh, sustain the longer term um, success of that collection or project. Um, so these Web2 companies can tap into the opportunity for um, engaging with their communities that they've built, these Web3 communities that they've built, um, and using tools like, um, you know, potentially having, um, hi using hiring um, or, even tasks um, or certain types of quests for their community or opening that up to others around their collections um, to grow, um, you know, that specific um, business line. Um, so I think that that would be interesting territory to tap into. Um, and then just in general, I think Web2, um, there's an opportunity for uh, Web2 to tap into an expansive opportunity to tap into borderless hiring. Um, so we, you know, right now, again, they hire this traditional route of hiring um, an employee. They have, they go through an interview process. They come on board paying like a salary. Um, but uh, they could also utilize, um, you know, more like contractor work style. Um, so they could, um, you know, optimize on this Web3 industry that, um, now has, you know, more and more experienced contributors who can actually do work um, for um, that, um, that company, whatever they're looking for. So I think that that's a big opportunity. Um, so for instance, like with the DAC, um, that they're asking, uh, an events person on our team was asking, oh, what, what's your event strategy? And as I was building that out for the DAC, uh, I was realize you know what it's a job board um, I mean so it's job fair the job fairs would be an event that um, would be valuable so say for instance um, you know like college campuses they're looking for work um, and they can tap into the web3 space um, and they can find the uh, tasks or jobs available um, through this like decentralized um, like job board, task boards um, from other DACs, from DAOs, et cetera. So 
I think that this is just a huge opportunity, a scalable opportunity, just hiring in general and sourcing work and finding work. Um, so that's how I see, you know, like there might be more like adoption um, and Web2 companies using um, like decentralized hiring to their benefit. Yeah, definitely attracting much more than just, you know, NFT collections and then and whatnot from like Nike or Tiffany. Um, definitely can see more utility than just, you know, hey, let's launch a collection, get money and then get out. No, it's it's, it's more of just like, hey, you know, we're gonna we're gonna build something and then we're gonna grow it with um, with more people coming in, contributing, working, you know, essentially building our own type of like subsidiary, essentially. Yeah, you can see that vision. For the final thoughts, um, Ishida, if you were to summarize, what do you think the next big trend in the DAO space is and where do you think it's headed? Yeah, so I think the next big trend for DAOs is going to be more clarity. Um, Last cycle was full of building and executing for DAOs with little established direction. Um, and I think this bear market in the next few years will be defined by more research and direction and definition for DAOs. Um, and this might come in the form of like specialization, specialization which we've talked about a bunch. Um, I mean, I also see like within this, I also see more DAO wrappers come up as tooling um, because legislation is also years down the line um, as things go. Um, I think more DAO wrappers will arise that make them more compliant and protect, protect workers um, and bring on more DAO participants who are not typical to the Web3 space. And I also see often initiatives from teams such as the DAO Research Collective, who is focused on helping builders and thinkers move the space forward. Um, and yeah, I think I am excited to see more research and more people enter the space. And that will in itself define where DAOs go. Um, this journey is going to be a long one, but I think it will be fruitful. Excellent. I like to hear that that regulation and, and research is, is the primary mode to uh, next big trend. Uh, definitely can see that happening and advancing. Uh, and for Chelsea, um, what do you think the next big trend in the DAO space is? And uh, where do you think it's headed? Yeah, uh, hopefully regulation is friendly. Um, I, I do think that that is definitely a narrative that will be um, a trend that we'll see in the upcoming future. And uh, there are a lot of um, individuals as well as groups, you know, not only researching and learning more about the DAO, but um, speaking on behalf of it um, to legislators and um, representing us to regulators. Uh, so uh, hopefully, you know, with that, we'll get more clear regulations. But I do think that that's a big trend in the DAO space, definitely. Um, and I also think that um, how to establish the way that that will play out, I think, um, like, when you can you can establish a nonprofit, you can establish a company, um, but how do you establish a DAO? Um, the DAC is the company model, so you could you know establish a um, D a company, um, uh, but it's like also could be that DAO is more like DAO. Um, like you just have like how do you identify it in like I don't know like interchangeably. Um, like how how is it identified as a DAO? Um, just like a clear specification. We know what a DAO is, but you know, with the law and how to register for that um, and the regulations around it. So I think that that's a big thing, um, and I do think it's coming. And I do think that there will be an entity that can be registered as a DAO um, or a DAC um, in the future. Uh, so I was talking with the legislator myself, and he was like, "I like the DAC." Um, we, I want to make it so that uh, we can register them in New York, <laughs> and but there's they he needs support, he needs the community, he needs um, people to speak on behalf of it to lobby for it. Um, so I think that that's happening. 
and it is happening. Um, so I also see that there's, you know, a bit more of an efficiency focus, as we talked about a lot today. Um, I think that would be a big focus for uh, DAOs because they're not necessarily, um, you know, they're still early. So a lot of changes within structure um, and then new forms of governance. Uh, so moving away from token governance to like social governance, for instance, um, reputation based governance. I think will definitely be um, a trend in the space. It's already popping up here and there and hear a lot of talk about it, um, but need the tools and infrastructure for that. Um, and uh, I think that Web2 will also, I think it will start dabbling into different types of infrastructures and opportunities in a decentralized space. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, I don't think it's going to be... Um, it's not going to be as bolsterous as it, as we saw during the last cycle because we're in the bear now, so maybe we don't seem as attractive. But um, I do think that there are certain specific areas that are um, uh, beneficial and would be of interest, business interest to Web2, um, such as hiring, like I mentioned before. And yeah, so I just, I think that like the DAO space will, tr I think that, the, you know, it'll change. Um, and we are working towards a, um, our DAC model um, and you know DAC itself it's not actually new I didn't come up with that <laughs> Vitalik talked about it in the past um, so just moving it towards a more efficient model uh, I think and more efficiency in the DAO space is where it's headed awesome efficiency regulation you know boring things but essential <laughs> I think I think that you know we, we, we all we all could could need a bit more you know like like going in and uh, you know, joining a DAO, actually like they're like oh you know I know what to do now. So I like it. I like everything. Thank you so much for attending this Twitter Spaces, Ashita and Chelsea. I very much appreciate the insights that you have in terms of the DAO and the DAC space. Um, definitely would like to hear more. Um, and then, like you know, please, uh, ev everyone here, you know, follow and 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 um, um, follow both Ashita and, and and Chelsea. Uh, definitely have some more insights in the future with that. Thank, um, thank you for having us. Thank yeah. you. It's great speaking with you, Ashita. Thanks, Pavel. Yeah, and uh, yeah, th thank you everyone for joining, and uh, have a have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Thank you.